Okay, thank you, Roger. Uh, halftime is almost over, and we're gonna try to get some last-minute instructions from the coach. We're gonna try to get a word from him right now. Uh, here he comes now. Uh, coach, can we get a word from you real quick? Yeah, sure, Kate. Now, what did you tell your players before they left the locker for the second half? Well, what I told them was just, just relax and concentrate and play some ball. I mean, you know, you leave the candy and the girls alone because that makes your legs move. You know, what I'm trying to get them to do is don't let them dictate the game. And I believe if we play as hard as we can, then we can play up to our potential, OJ. Well, look, how do you feel about the uh, the team's first half performance? Well, you know, I, anytime you have a big game, I mean, you're going to have some jitters. I mean, if we could start sticking to people, putting the hat on the people, you know, give them 110% every single time, then I believe the Super Bowl is out. OK, well, look here. What do you think? What do you think you guys are going to do around about the second half? I mean, you guys got a lot of opportunities to get them. Buffalo got his running game going really, really, really. Well. What are you going to do about that? They're really penetrating the game. What are you guys going to do about that? Well, what we're going to do is play some control type offense. I mean, we got to keep the ball from them in the second half. I mean, you know, we got to the game and, you know, open that up. I mean, because if we don't do that, and I know it's hard for you to hear me, but we'll get a few breaks and we'll be fine. You know, but as you know, this game is a game of ups and downs. So we're going to go out there and get the momentum going for us, you know? Well, look, uh, Buffalo got their uh, running game going early. They're penetrating the line. What are you going to do about that? Are you going to put some linebackers in? Are you going to stop the stuff up so they say? What is going to happen in the second half on that? Well, what we're going to try to do is get our passing game going. I mean, as you know, the war is not over. The battle has to keep being fought. I mean, we can't allow them to play. I mean, they're playing worse than my grandmother would play. So they just got to go out there with their hands. Well, I think that's the uh, signal for the second half. I got one more question to ask you. Are you going to go with your air attack? I mean, we haven't seen you do a lot of passing this game. Well, we're going to keep playing up every round. And then we're going to try to keep, you know, get the passing game wide open for us. Well, thank you, Coach. I'm going to have to go ahead and wrap this up. Roger, back to you. We're going to be looking forward to a great second half of football. Clinton's lead economic advisor. Tell me, Mr. Kellerman, what is the main focus of the committee going to be during this next fiscal year? Well, Kathy, things aren't going to be as simple as they seem at first. There are a lot of factors to be taken into account. <clears throat> Whenever you're going to try to balance the budget, there are several ways to do it. <clears throat> now, we're going to have to concentrate on the approaches that will best suit the American people without compromising the current financial security. Tell me, uh, will there be large cuts in Medicaid and Social Security? Well, now that's a very complicated question. Although there will have to be some substantial cuts in government aided programs, there will also be tax breaks for the elderly. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to be easy. There are sacrifices that need to be made. But if we all pull together, I truly believe we can bring this to a conclusion that's amenable to all parties. Your critics say that these are the exact same policies that have failed in the past. How would you respond to that? Well, now, I've addressed this point over and over again. The issue is not what has failed in the past, but what will work in the future. You know, we want to stop worrying about what is behind us and look ahead. Last week, the Dow plummeted 80 points. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned with the current volatile state of the stock market? Well, now, what we're seeing is a short-term weakness. The stock market is traditionally influenced by world events. Recent troubles in the Middle East, the decline of the Deutsche Mark. You're bound to see some temporary instability. What sort of a timetable are we looking at here? Well, these things can't be rushed. You must be patient. Let the current recession run its course. And then we will be ready to tackle this problem with total equanimity. Mm. In closing, Mr. Kellerman, can this plan work? Can this council make a difference? Well, let me just say this. We know that there are people out there who are hurting. I can stand up here all day and say, things are going to get better. But see, that's not going to help that man in Trenton, New Jersey, who just lost his job. We'll put our best minds to the task and then run it up the flagpole and see if it's wearing panties. Thank you, Mr. Kellerman. We certainly wish you luck with that. This is Kathy Williams reporting from the White House. Leaving three dead and possibly two others wounded. I have with me Officer Douglas Danforth of Precinct 26. 
Officer Danforth? Uh, yes, Debbie. Officer, early reports have indicated that these deaths are organized crime related. Can you confirm this? Uh, it would certainly seem so, Debbie. The victims were all known to be affiliated with the Parigi crime family. As you know, the family has been torn by a bloody power struggle since last month's death of the recruited godfather, Roberto Parigi. So, do you have positive identifications on these victims? Uh, we won't be positive until we can check their dental records. But these men were well known around the neighborhood as well as the family in court. But just tonight, I've been speaking with some local residents, and they seem very reluctant to say anything about these men. Is that for fear of reprisals? I'm going to have to say caution. Despite his troubles, the Parigi family remains a force in this community. Certainly, nobody wants to go on record identifying these men as criminals. But you also have to realize that the community, these men are commanded. They got respect in the community. But that money, does that come at, at a price? Uh, they're family men, and absolutely, it does come at a price. We're talking business loans at up to 50% interest, and believe me, if you didn't pay on time, you won't be uh, very lucky. I see. Uh, do you have any leads on who might want these men dead? Uh, right now, our best guess is it was an inside job, perhaps linked to the reports that an internal battle... <laughs> of a bloody power struggle or just the beginning? Uh, rival organizations may see this uh, as their chance to rid themselves of the Pariti family once and for all. So what you're saying is the community can rest easy tonight? Uh, I wish I knew, Debbie. In the meantime, residents in the community will surely feel increased police presence. We're on top of the matter, and I'd like to stress that nobody in this community has anything to fear. Thank you very much, Officer Danforth. Again, three are dead, two are wounded, and the culprits are still at large. From the corner of Anderson and Wilder, this is Debbie Woodruff, back to you in the studio. And one more thing I might say, if you can tune in this evening and make sure if you have any news or any speculation on who these men might be, please call our studio and let us know as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Back to you, Bob. This is Kitty Singleton in the Fox News Room. Joining us tonight is the Director of Housing and Urban Development, Mr. Richard Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, how have the recent budget cuts affected HUD? Terribly. Uh, our agency was one of the hardest hit by the cutbacks, largely due to the negative press over past scandals, which is tragic because low-income housing is essential to the welfare of the country. By making cutbacks in our department, you are really shutting the door on the future of our children. But what reassurances do we have that impropriety won't happen again? Well, I guess all you have is my word. See, when the Treasury was first set up, they lacked a mission statement. Unclear goals of the department that allowed the situation to get way out of hand. Employees were not required to get projects and loans approved through proper channels. But since that time, new rules have been implemented which provide safeguards against that ever happening again. Now, you mentioned a mission statement. What is HUD's mission statement? Well, I can't tell you the exact wording, but we are here to help provide low-income families the chance for affordable housing and, in the process, help develop the inner city. How will the cuts in the budget hurt HUD? Well, Kitty, the budget cuts were based on the idea that the interest rate would fall below 4%, thus lowering the need for HUD dollars. But the interest rate has remained constant, which will deplete the funds that HUD has allowed for low interest loans. So what exactly is HUD doing to revitalize the nation's crime-ridden public housing? Well, as you know, there are over 3.4 million Americans living in public housing, and HUD has delegated over $483 million for rebuilding and security purposes. We're here open to improve the housing department so that the families can once again feel secure in their own home. But won't the cutbacks be detrimental to public housing? Uh, regardless of the presidential budget cuts, public housing is our number one priority. So I would like to reassure the low-income tenants that even though the president is retreating from urban homesteading, the housing department will not abandon these people. Now, what projects can we expect to see from HUD in the near future? Oh, well, to name all the goals of HUD would be futile considering the time allotted here. But I can tell you that the new commission that was designed not only to help the consumer, but also the infrastructure of our inner cities. Okay, now you speak about public housing, but what about the first-time home buyer? With proper employee verification, we can ensure that those people will be the first on the list to get homes with substantial down payments. 
thank you very much, Mr. Sullivan, for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us here today. It's been my pleasure. This has been Kitty Singleton, live for Fox News. Good night. Jennifer Moss coming to you live from the Green Ridge Forest, the center of a brewing controversy between wildlife conservationists and loggers who would like to have this area leveled. With me now is Park Ranger Dan McDermott. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Uh, Ranger McDermott, uh, these issues are highly volatile. Now, can you sort them out for our viewers? Well, Jennifer, pretty much comes down to your, uh, to your uh, spotted marsh goose. There's uh, fewer than 900 of the geese left out in his, these parts in these woods, and uh, when these woods are gone, uh, you can pretty much plant, uh, plant a kiss on a fanny at a spotted uh, marsh goose, you know. Now, that would be a shame as far as I'm concerned, because nothing more beautiful than seeing one of them big birds just take off out of the marsh in the morning. It'd be one thing if they were, you know, hunting for food, but it's the senseless killing that I got a problem with. <laughs> You can't just take uh, one element out of the ecosystem. You got your, uh, you got your fly, your mosquito, you got your elm beetle, and uh, you take uh, so pretty much you're up your eyeballs and bugs. Well, that may very well be. Yet the loggers contend that the economy of the ridge is dependent upon the very clearing of the forest. Oh, well, short term, we're talking a few jobs, maybe 150 new jobs. That's kind of a pain if you're out of work. But uh, the state also depends on its nature reserves and tourist dollars, and that's kind of important too. You cut these trees back, they're not coming back, you know. Yes. It's obviously a very touchy and sensitive issue. Uh -huh. uh, loggers have been clashing with conservationists right here in these very woods. Uh, have there been any outbreaks of violence lately? Well, uh, you know, I can like you, you know, the uh, tempers are flaring high and we've been able to keep things civilized so far, but I can't guarantee you it's going to stay like that, you know. So the loggers are not going to get up these woods without a fight. Well, Miss, I'm from Green Ridge, and I know lumberjacks. They like to get liquored up, and they like, to, they like to fight. They're Scandinavians, and they're mean, you know, and they are. Well, is the Department of the Interior close to making a decision in this matter? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, we're not holding our breath out here, you know. Yeah, so you're saying you, you expect the federal bureaucracy to take its sweet time. <laughs> well, there's a bear dump in the woods. <laughs> Yes, well, thank you, Randy McGurk, very much. And uh, through it all, the spotted marsh goose flies peacefully overhead, unaware that their fate is being decided in Washington as we speak. For Fox News, this is Jennifer Moss, Green Ridge Forest. From Fort Lauderdale, Florida, for Fox News, I'm joined today by City Councilman Bill Davis. Mr. Davis, how is this hitty holding up during spring break? Well, Shelly, the city is doing just fine. This time of year is always a little hectic down here in Florida, especially in the Fort Lauderdale area. But as always, we are equipped to handle the onslaught of tourists and college students such as they are and will be soon. How long does the spring break season last? Well, I wish I could tell it goes on all year, because that's not the case. A lot of the down here is pretty dull, and there's just a lot of people staying indoors while watching TV. But this time here is great. Not all the colleges, however, take the breaks at the same time of holiday. I've noticed a trend for the East Coast colleges to have their spring breaks earlier than the Midwestern schools do, such as they are. What do you think motivates the East Coast schools to take their vacation time early? Well, I don't know. I wouldn't have any idea. I'm not a psychic. <laughs> but I do have a theory on the topic, and that is that it's a little colder out there, therefore they'd like to get rid of that fever and can the fever, which often makes man go crazy and do wild things in his home. Earlier than say the Midwest. And because of all the bad weather, they're probably more likely to get away from that cabin fever quicker and be away from the inclement climate, so as it is. This seems like an important time for the economy here in Fort Lauderdale. How does it compare to the rest of the Well, any of these students who've uh, studied macroeconomics, which I have not, but you do have, they're pretty late, did I tell you that? Uh, they know the fair price system is based on supply and demand, and most of the retail stores here, well, just like Christmas time down here. This is our Christmas season, you might say, except we don't have any red suits or jingle bells. Right. <laughs> but uh, in the next five weeks, it's going to be a very big shot there financially, speaking for uh, the people down here, such as they are. Uh, it surprised me to hear that college students have millions of dollars to spend because when I, I remember when I was in college, I had very, very little spending money. Well, I don't believe I said millions, but perhaps they do. But you tell you what it is, it works out like this. Now, one of the college students on his own, he'll come down here, he maybe just have enough for a six packets of Jiffy Pop. But you put a 600,000 college student together, that's a heck of a lot of Jiffy Pop, if you know what I'm saying. What are other ways that the students help the economy? Well, the students bring a lot of sand into the area. And uh, the sand actually contributes to the sand we have here. They just track it in from other students, actually. Now, the, the 
you have also there's companies that try to target these students who are between 18 and 24. And that transition to big dollars, so they just set the headquarters up down here during the break, that's big money for a corporate person. I understand. Well, Mr. Davis, I thank you for your time and well, hospitality thank you, here. You're pretty as a peach, did I tell you that? <laughs> thank I like them ears. My, my, my gal has a, has a petty slack. Well, I bought them here in Fort Lauderdale. Did you? Well, well that's yes, good. I did. It probably made me one of a local craftsmen. Oh, well, they were. <laughs> that's what they said. All righty. Well, thank you, you Mr. Davis. You take care Davis. now. And as you look around the beach, you'll see a lot of fun and a lot of excitement. I'm Shelley Miller here at Fox News. <laughs>